Uh, hey, Adam, what's up? Hey, Andrew, not much. Just chilling. Oh, my gosh. Lab this week, I'm telling you. Was it awful? The first one I had on Tuesday was, like, I managed to avoid total chaos. Morning. Morning. You'll never believe what happened today in E&M. We got out half an hour early. I didn't feel like he was going fast or anything. It's just all of a sudden it was done. Anyway, things have changed, and the time is now. So today it's all live. So I just want to show you today's T-shirt. Just So I stated Cauchy theorem. I decided to, you know, first tell you the facts of life and then... Um, prove them, but the you know, main thing is to remember. So Cauchy's theorem says that any contour that uh, of a holomorphic function as Z that doesn't include any singularities of function Z, every contour vanishes. I'll give you a derivation that I learned from Goldberg that he learned from somebody else, which is, uh, you know, kind of qualitative perturbative derivation. Here is the idea. Suppose you would like to compute the contour integral on C. Now one way to do this is to find a nearby contour integral that lives in our grid. So it goes either horizontally, vertically, horizontally. And let's say you know it's inside so it's a slightly smaller contour. And in the limit of epsilon going to zero, this converges to um, the smooth contour. So it's a discretization of a contour. And contour doesn't have to be smooth at all. It could be a you know, fractal curve. It just has to be continuous. So then what you can do is you realize that on every square in the grid of size of epsilon, you can put a little square running around. Now, if you put a little square next to it running around, then the two arrows, one going up and one going down, will cancel and you get a bigger rectangle. So you can actually just integrate over all little squares inside and the only thing they'll contrib contribute is this outer edge because all the other edges will align and gets, uh, get to be um, cancel pairwise on each link. So we can write this integral as a discrete sum of all the squares inside the counter. And now we just have to compute a function on any given square. So now we'll do it just by estimating stuff. So what could be the size of a little square counter? Well, you know, the most naive thing to say is when I integrate around something that has four edges, it could be just the sum of the edges. So it could be the value of the function. And you know, as this thing gets uh, small, we assume f of z, this is a holomorphic function, it's smooth. So it doesn't change its value much. So the only important thing is, you know, the size of the integral. So you could say it's a perimeter. But then you say, well, you know, probably not perimeter because I'm going up here and going down here. So I will have to subtract the value, add the value. So uh, that's an overestimate. So let's say there's some cancellation. So integral on this, you expect it to be of order epsilon square. So is that true? Now that would make sense because to compute this whole integral, uh, you know, we have to, um, how many of these squares are there? Well, their number goes like epsilon squared because if I make them smaller, you know, more of them fit 
inversely epsilon here, inversely epsilon here. So their number uh, is one over epsilon squared, that's number of boxes. And if each box was something, then it would scale in a sensible way and we will get a finite answer. So if the, this was not uh, a holomorphic function, but just a general integral in two dimensions, you know, that's how you could say this is a good way to discretize the integral. And uh, we show that, you know, we get an answer by computing the limit, etc. However, the thing is more magical than that. Uh, because f is holomorphic, we know the following thing from what we did last week. If you run around a little square in a z plane, so it has four corners, one, two, three, four, the sides are epsilon, i epsilon, minus epsilon, and minus i epsilon, uh, because, you know, it's directed interval. The holomorphic mapping, mapping of a function into the function plane, doesn't change small shapes. You know, it rotates them and rescales them. We call that umph twist. So what we see in, uh, in the image of a small square will be a small square. And, you know, this point will map this one, this corner will map to this one, this one will map here, this one will map here. And uh, the size will be different. And let's say that uh, distance between these two points is a C, D, B, you know, because they are the same size. So what does the integral look like when it's discretized? DZ takes these four values, epsilon minus I epsilon, and the integral takes values, uh, you know, this length. So this is the mean value of this function over uh, the integral, uh, then, you know, it has some value here, it has some value here, it has some value there. Now, take the real part, I get A minus C, take the complex part, I get B minus D. And, um, but it's a square, so the distance, Difference between these two guys is the same as difference between these two guys. And what do you know? All the sides are the same. So in this very small square limit, holomorphic limit, we find out that the integral around square vanishes. And uh, that means that all little squares are zero. Uh, we are making here an error, you know, when they're finite size, uh, the next error is of order one over epsilon. Uh, so we are making this error, which is not at of quadratic order, as we were estimating here, but it's actually, after cancellation, the cubic term survives. And that means that every square contributes zero, and that means that when you look at this integral, the counter integral is zero. Now, you know, that's the essence of the proof that of the counter, uh, Cauchy counter or Cauchy's theorem, you should object to it. So the usual proof is you first show Green's theorem that relates perimeter to the interior of a curve in a plane, and then you use Cauchy-Riemann to make this official. Uh, you look at differentials rather than little geometrical distances, and you prove the theorem exactly. So that's essence of the Cauchy theorem. It says any contour of all more 
trig function with no singularities inside uh, can be you know, tiled with little squares and all of them are zero because there is nothing singular and that's how it works. And that led us to our most important example for applications. So that's where I finished last time. If I do have a singularity, then there is a trick of sticking two curves with opposite radii, two circles around the singularity. If I take counters with opposite directions of exactly the same counter, uh, they add up to zero because they're negative of each other. Then what you do is you stick a little bridge, infinitely narrow bridge between one of those circles, the one that uh, has the right direction. And then um, you have a contour uh, C1, uh, which doesn't encounter any singularities, so that one is zero. And you have to compute things around the circle. Now, computing things around the circle is very easy because you use the angle as parametrization. The radius is constant. The radius constant angle here. You stick this into parameterized version of the integral. You get draw EIFI here. The Z of this just gives you an I down here in delta theta. And uh, because this is dimensionally z over z, uh, the lengths cancel and the phases cancel and you just run around the circle, you get two pi i when you have a simple pole. Now you can say, well, okay, you know, but what if I have a nastier pole? And I don't mean again, any ethnic stuff here, you know, this should be a disaster, right? Because we know that when we integrate something which is 1 over x squared times x, this is so singular in a real line that um, it gives me a divergent answer. But in a complex plane, what happens is I stick square here, so r gets squared, and I get a phase going around twice, that is uh, two times theta. Upstairs, dz is as it used to be before. This is just dz expressed in terms of d theta. Uh, rows cancel, now this has a finite radius, the circle, so I get one over rho in front, and I get an integral of delta theta, and this doesn't, phases don't quite cancel, I get minus i theta from these two phases. Now, what's this integral? It's very easy to understand geometrically in the plane. So you're in Gauss plane, this is real direction imaginary, and this is on a unit circle, magnitude one. And for any given theta, my little vector in two dimensional plane points to the point here, and as I do the integral, there is always an opposite vector in opposite direction, which exactly cancels. So the average of running around this circle is zero. So it turns out this is obviously going to work for any, any z to the m. So it turns out this is not a disaster. It's actually zero. Now, we also knew that if... Uh, I had here z in exponent. That's a holomorphic function. Simplest examples are polynomials, powers of n. So integ contour integral over holomorphic function is supposed to be zero. So it turns out that I could take m to be any integer, positive or negative, and it's only when m equals one that I get answer one. So I can write as a Kronecker delta. So this is a, you might think, a complicated way of writing something that has value one or zero, Kronecker delta. But it's a very powerful method in applications when you are in a complex plane. So that's one way of uh, 
replacing a Kronecker delta one or zero by an integral in complex plane. And that will be now combined with many other things. So how do we use this Cauchy magic? So here, you know, the books throw infinitely many random integrals that, you, that you're supposed to evaluate to get a feeling for it. So here is an example. We take an integrand, which is e to the z. Now, e to the z is a bad news because if z is very large, this is a huge number, right? Divided by z, that could be bad news because if z is very small, that might be divergent. Uh, and then, for good measure, there is z squared minus 16. But the problem is, to, they ask you to evaluate this integral on the boundary of the annual region, which has one edge is radius one, so it's this circle. And one is radius two, this circle. And these circles run in opposite directions. So whenever you're given an object like this, you're supposed to first say what are its singularities. Well, it has a pole at zero, so one of the singularities at the origin. It has a pole at plus or minus four. So it's sitting either here or there. And then it also goes bananas when z is very large in magnitude. But our counter avoids all of these guys. And uh, uh, what we can do is we can throw a little bridge here uh, going this way, that way, that uh, adds zero to integral. This counter has nothing in it. And it turns out this nasty looking integral is just zero. So we are lucky in a lots of applications of that nature. Here is another integral that you might or might not recognize from before. Uh, you know, I taught you that determinant, log of determinant is a trace of log. Determinant is characteristic determinant. It will vanish at all the roots of a polynomial. So that's written down here. So this polynomial is just any polynomial we use as a characteristic polynomial. And you might need to compute its logarithm. Now, the derivative of logarithm is 1 over the function times the derivative of the function. And downstairs, we can write this polynomial of order n in terms of its roots. So these are all its roots. And there is some overall scaling factor. Upstairs, we can take derivative of this quantity. Now, you know, derivative is very simple. When we take a derivative on product of factors, then we first take derivative first term. So that removes that term. Then we take the real to second term that removes the second term and so on. And when we take this ratio, what's going to be in the denominator, but not in the numerator is the term that's missing when I took this derivative. So this is actually just a sum or one over Z minus alpha. And these are simple poles. So what does a contour do? Here is an example of a counter, and here are examples of the poles. Well, what the counter does by our, you know, main trick that uh, we can replace it by little circles around every simple pole, is it gets a contribution of all the poles in the inside. It's a number of poles 
inside. It's just an integer. So, you know, it might look like a nasty integral, but it's just number of the pole inside the counter C. And this is kind of the general spirit of how going into the complex plane makes things that, you know, might have looked totally horrible on a real axis, uh, totally simple in a complex world. When I gave you a general recipe how to integrate the poles, then I said, well, you know, whenever you have singularities, you can replace a counter by the sum over small neighborhoods of singularities. That's what this sum is. Then on each singularity, you have to compute it. But then there was an extra number, which was an integer whose value depended on the contour k and on the singularity itself. So I have to explain what that is. And that's a pretty thing, you know, which makes complex analysis so beautiful and is a gateway to much of the modern geometry and uh, uh, modern theoretical physics. It's a notion of winding number. So interpretation of this integer mu is that given a curve in a plane L, some loop or loops, and given point P, this integer is the number of windings. The loop L winds around P. So here are examples. Uh, if you have a simple curve, you know, so that is a point P in a plane, and the loop runs around it once, and it does it in anti-clockwise manner, then this winding number is one when I come back. Now, how do you, there are many clever ways of computing it, but here is the simplest, you know, what it means. It's suppose that there was a ball or a bead or a little boy running around this loop, and your mother and you're looking at it. And at every time you turn toward the little boy, so boy runs around here. So now you turn 180 degrees, then the boy comes here. And then, you know, you're looking this way and then you have to turn a little bit back. And by the time you are done, you have turned around only once. Suppose you're running around some rectangle and you're running, the boy is running this way. You go around, it's anti-clockwise, so you turn two pi in this direction. Suppose your mother and the boy runs around or the dog or whatever runs around this way and this is the leash to the dog, you know, runs, 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 runs. By this time you have turned two pi, but now it runs one, you know, a small loop again. So you run around two times. Suppose you're here and uh, your beloved infant is doing very complicated thing, running this way, running this way, coming back, running the other way and starting at a point. Well, you know, half of the time you're winding this way, but then when the, you reverse around that way and the total winding is zero. Now suppose some crazier thing happens. So it runs this way, that way, that way, and you know, you can sit various places, you know, so what are the winding numbers in various places? So the main notion here is really not particular point, but they're whole domains of points, domain one and two that have the same winding numbers. So for example, anybody inside the loop will see one winding. Anybody outside the loop will see, you know, going a little left and a little right and coming exactly where you have zero windings. And when you have more intersections of the loops, then uh, you will have different domains, you know, that is outside, 
there is a first insight, there is another insight, and then there is another domain. And the first observation is that you are on the outside, so you're not in the domain, you're sitting here, you'll have one the number zero. But if you are inside the domain, you can have winding numbers which are not zero. So let's uh, do them in a little more detail. And there are two ways to do this. You know, you can look at the counter and you can just visualize what's going on. So suppose you're sitting here. So that was, you know, one of the four possible domain. You're sitting someplace inside. What you're allowed to do is you're allowed to uh, change contours as long as they don't cross poles. So you're allowed to move this part of the contour, move it here. And once you do this, you realize, aha, but I'm in the outside world. I'm free. So my uh, winding number is zero. That's one way to look at it. You can also uh, say I'm a point and I'm moving a little bit around. So that's more of a local rather than global way of thinking about it. So I'm here and there is you know, part of the counter close to me. Well, you know, I'll just move in through the counter and I'm not allowed to cross it. Uh, that would topologically be a different thing, so just deform it. And I realize I can deform it in such a way that the counter can be on my left and I have a circle. Now, the circle, if this was a simple pole, for example, would mean that uh, I increment the winding number by one because this is number, winding number one. And I'm now in a situation where I've gotten rid of this extra circle. So you can move the points around and increment these winding numbers. And that now brings us, you know, to general way of doing counter integration. Whatever your counter integral or counter k is, no matter how complicated, you look at all the singularities, you look at little neighborhoods of singularities, and uh, each one of them locally have to compute, and uh, each one of them will have an integer weight going along with it, which depends on the counter and depends on singularity. So far, you know, I've done one simple integral in which there was no interesting function. Function was one over z. That was the only non-trivial integral I've done. Suppose you have a general holomorphic function uh, where z is uh, inside the curve. So there is a counter and z is someplace inside of it. Now consider the following thing that's called Cauchy integral formula. I take my function, divide it by the distance between my curve and the point I'm interested in, see, so this is zeta. And I integrate on this curve the function itself. Uh, now, what I can do is I can add to it a constant. It's a value of the function. So this is value of the function at a point. So that's a constant. I can add it and I can subtract it. That gives me these two terms. So it's the same integral. I've just added and subtracted a constant. Now look at this term. Well, that's a definition of differential uh, first derivative. You know, I have value of the function at two nearby points divided by the distance between the two points. So that's a derivative. Function is holomorphic, meaning all of its derivatives are nice smooth functions as well. 
And that means this object doesn't have a singularity. So this integral over the derivative of function is zero by holomorphicity. Now, this derivative, one over two pi i times the counter over around simple pole running around this point, we just computed it. It was a Kronecker delta. It was a one if the curve, you know, the counter contains singularity. Here is the singularity, so there is a one. And we get the formula that the function can be replaced by counter integral. It seems like a complication, but it's actually a very powerful thing, as it will turn out. So here is, you know, an example. Take function z just to be z, you know, our simplest holomorphic function in a library of holomorphic function. And now I'll show that if I want to assign z inside the counter, but count the zero outside the counter, uh, I can do the following thing. I have z in the line, take a circular counter of radius r in the z plane. And again, you know, why are we doing this stuff? In Zangwill's course, you might have to know uh, whether if you have a charged particle inside of some boundary, you know, what is the force that's being exerted? And outside the boundary, what is the force that's being exerted? Or if you're being taught classical mechanics by Wiesenfeld me, and you know, there was a beautiful result that Newton discovered. If I have a shell of matter, thin shell, but spherical, you know, he showed that if I'm outside, I'll feel a force as though all the mass was at the origin, a point particle of total mass. But if I'm inside, the force will cancel and I'll get zero, you know. So this is why we're looking at this kind of integrals. If I say, let my function be z on the counter itself, circular counter of radius r, but you might want to know what's this function, what is its value when it's inside the counter. We do the same thing that we just did. Original function is uh, dz on the counter, on this counter. We add to it the function, which is happens to be z, and subtract it, subtract it, and add it. This one, this factor, this is just a simple poll, and now it cares whether the count the z is inside the counter or outside the counter, counter. Uh, if it's inside, I get one. If it's outside, I get zero. And this one is just uh, you know, integral over two pi uh, around. So that's uh, entire function, no singularity, that's zero. So now we have gotten uh, an integral representation of the statement, I have a function. Counter now can be more complicated because I'm allowed to deform it any way I want to. And now I have an integral statement of what it means that the function takes value z if it's inside the counter uh, or z outside. So this is some kind of Kronecker delta or heaviside function that says, if z is inside counter c, I get one. Outside, I get zero. Once we have Cauchy integral formula, the derivatives of the functions are trivial to get because notice the only dependence on z is just in this uh, denominator 
everything else doesn't depend on it. So, to take a derivative, take a derivative of both sides of this equation. On the right-hand side, you take the derivative. You have to prove that interchange of integration and derivation is allowed. I will not prove it, but uh, that you can check the literature for the proofs. Interchange is legal. So we put derivative on the right-hand side. Derivative of 1 over something is just the thing squared minus, but there is a minus here, so it comes out as a plus sign. And that's a formula for the first derivative of the function. Second derivative, you do exactly the same. You take a derivative of that thing. It gives you minus 2, but then there is a minus z, so that comes as a plus, and you get a cube. And clearly, for the k derivative, you get here k factorial. Here you get an extra k plus 1 because you started with 1 over c. And these are formulas for all derivatives. Simple. If the function is holomorphic, then its first derivative, second derivative, you know, we've used the fact that the first derivative is also holomorphic. It's a smooth function. Second derivative should be smooth, and all of derivatives should exist. And now the kth derivative of the function can be represented as a, by contour integral where I divide my function this k plus first power of the pole. So there is a representation of operation of taking a derivative as a contour integral over the function itself divided by the pole. So that turns out to be quite powerful in evaluating this. Why? Because, you know, your problem might be defined someplace where this function is complicated. But if you have a contour, you might be able to take it to some different uh, region of the complex plane where it's very easy to evaluate. That's the essence of these tricks. Now, you can cheat by something that you know, but, you know, that's doing things in reverse. You already know about Taylor series. I'll do them uh, next week. But in complex plane, you know about real Taylor series. And, you know, you know that you can take an entire function and write it as a sum of the terms with higher and higher powers of, of z. Mm -hmm. Or rho minus z, if you expand around uh, point z, but your function is at rho. So, you can verify that, you know, this definition agrees with the usual understanding of Taylor function because all of the guys in the sum will have powers of z, but then we use this amazing relationship that if I have any power other than 1 over z, contour integral will be 0. But you can verify it if you know that there should be Taylor series. So as an application of this, uh, there is a thing called Liouville theorem. So again, complex analysis has a bunch of these cute results, which are very general, very powerful. So you say, you know, here I am, I've derived this function, which is entire. I've proven it has no singularities. No place on the complex plane. I've also proven that it doesn't explode, you know, it doesn't have poles, but doesn't have floats, which means it's bounded on a complex plane. Yeah. That's entire function doesn't have singularities, but it also doesn't go off to infinity on a complex plane. 
We will say as well, great, very boring function. It has to be a constant. So this is, you know, a application of this formula, k equals one. When k equals one, the derivative of the function is obtained by looking at the square of the pole, not a simple pole, but pole squared. Now, if you look at the magnitude of the function, just uh, then, you know, a magnitude of i is one, so you get one here. And inside, what we will get, the magnitude of downstairs is just the magnitude of uh, ray, you know, I take this contour to be on a circle, uh, so radius of the circle minus the magnitude. <coughs> I'm, uh, you know, cheating a little bit here. Uh, you should correct me, but magnitude of z. Now, I assume that z is, you know, someplace fixed, so it's not off at infinity. It's maybe at the origin close by. That's what z is. And uh, dz, you know, gets to be d5 times the radius of the circle. And then I look at the magnitude of the function. Now, I can, on any given circle, the magnitude varies of the function as I move on a circle around the origin. So I can put a bound, I can say, you know, let me take the highest possible magnitude it's some function that was, you know, going up and down on the circle. Let me take the highest possible, the maximum of the function here. But then I get one over r, the radius of the circle, times integral, angular integral to pi goes away. And that's a bound. Now I take arbitrarily large circle because I'm in a whole complex plane. Uh, one over r always uh, un overwhelms the finite uh, maximum of the function because it's, it was assumed to be bounded. And um, this goes to zero. So the first derivative of my function is zero, which means the function itself is constant. So that's Louisville's theorem. So you can have, cannot have a bounded function here is a related theorem called mean value theorem in this argument. Remember, to show that this integral is zero, I computed the mean value of the little vector in a complex plane. Complex number in the complex plane is just a unit vector pointing any place on the circle, and I averaged it, and I found the average is zero. Now I generalize this. Yep. Okay, yep. so step number one, we use Cauchy formula, where we write something that we believe is very simple, function of z, and we rewrite it as a contour integer in complex plane. Next we decide the contour is a circle around, of radius r around point z. So zeta runs this complex phase. In other words, z can, rho can be written as z plus the phase of that thing here. Uh, because when we look at the difference, you know, only difference is this phase. Then we change our variables in a parametric way, so we get that delta zeta is dz of all sides. This is constant. I get the derivative of delta theta. And this becomes the function of z plus rho i theta. And we run it on a circle. This cancels. And then there is an i that cancels this i and I get one over two pi on the circle, but it's being evaluated is the value of a function 
on arbitrary radius r. So here is z, and we are looking at a function of uh, z plus, these are two vectors, complex two-dimensional vectors in this vector. This is radius r, e to the r theta. And we just run it around. So the simplest example was, you know, when f was constant, that gave us zero in our original formula or other powers downstairs when it was one over z to some arbitrary power. But this now uh, turns out to be very powerful and practical because it could be that close to z, uh, the function of z is some complicated thing. For example, uh, you know, it's a polynomial with 17 terms and it oscillates while well in a small circle. But I can evaluate it on any circle. So I can take circle that's very, very large. When it's very large and F is, for example, polynomial, the only thing that matters is the leading term, Z to the N. All the other terms are dropping away. Uh, so so I, I find out that, you know, the value of this uh, function at Z is actually just determined in uh, terms of coefficients of the leading power uh, in this function when the function is large. And that could be a very simple calculation. So that we do all the time. Um, I have one last really quick question, just kind of yeah. about like, um, naming stuff. So what is the difference between a holomorphic function and an analytic function? Same. They're the same, okay. Yeah, it's just two words for the same thing. In both cases, you assume that uh, you can do the complex derivatives, and they don't. I don't. I don't think there's any difference. It's just when people teach complex analysis, they emphasize holomorphic entire versus analytic and having poles. But 